Good morning, good morning, friends and family. It is 10 3, I'm three minutes late. Good morning, I pray again that you had a wonderful week. I pray that even though things may not have been as well as you would have liked them to be or wanted them to be, that even in the midst of your circumstances, God was still good. And so I welcome you into this place of sanctuary. I welcome you into this word today. I welcome you into my little office and sanctuary. And I just want to ask God to lift us up today as we begin to study a bit of uh, the book of Nehemiah. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah today. I think it's the book after Ezra. And we are going to be in chapter one of Nehemiah. So go ahead and open up your books while I just begin to share with you that God is good no matter what. And if we get a mindset that God is good no matter what, we can find him in the midst of our traumatic circumstances. When things are rough and tough and not going well, when things are joyous and happy, when things are coming through and opening up for us, God is still good in the midst of that. God is good when we can't see his goodness. God is still good. His grace and his mercy endures forever. So I want to pray as we begin this word this morning. <clears throat> Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we give you glory, we give you honor. God, we give you our hearts today. We give you everything that is within us today. God, we lay down our burdens, we lay down our trials and tribulations, we lay down our troubles right now in the name of Jesus, God. Remembering that your word said, no weapon formed against us shall prosper, God. You said it will form, evil will come up against us, things will come up to destroy us and stop us and block us, but your word, the promise behind that is no, it will, will not prosper. So in the name of Jesus, send your spiritual prosperity to everyone that would hear this word today, God. Send your spiritual prosperity of healing and hope, God, peace and joy and comfort and encouragement. These things we ask in your son's name as we begin to break bread together, spiritual bread together, in the name of Jesus, and the church said, amen. If you have your Bibles, church, we are going to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. And in this book, uh, it's powerful. You know, we've been talking about prayer all month since the last Thursday and Sunday of July. We have been discussing prayer. And we are discussing prayer because we are empowering ourselves to prepare for our prayer conference on August 27th of this year at 9 a.m. Pacific time uh, here in California. And so we're asking God to open us up to new ideas and new thoughts about prayer. We're asking God to bathe us in his spirit so that we'll learn how to pray. And we are growing. We have had some dynamic speakers on Thursdays at our prayer uh, gathering at three o'clock Pacific Coast time. And if you haven't joined in with us, join in with us. We have three more Thursdays before the August 27th date is upon us, the conference. And our speakers are really pouring into us about prayer and what the word of God says about prayer. And God is pouring into them so they can pour out on us and we can take it in and pour out on others. Yes, Lord. So we thank you, Father. And then I am working at teaching on prayer every Sunday until the conference get here so we can have a prayer mindset, a prayer praying spirit, and uh, believers that walk through life and their circumstances pray. And our theme for our prayer ministry here at Rhythm of Life Church is pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. So we're going to go ahead and get started right now in the name of Jesus. So uh, I want to open up just one more Bible. Just does some back up here. There we go. So if all hearts and minds are clear, let's dig into it. Yes. So we're in the book of Nehemiah, right? You've heard that. We're talking about how Nehemiah faced his circumstances in uncertain times and desperate times. And so we want to be like Nehemiah. He is a perfect example of a praying man, of a praying believer, of a man who has faith, of a man who has God uh, in his mindset up front and personal with God. And so first of all, I want to ask the question, who is Nehemiah? 
And so as we did a little research here today, and along with what I learned back in my school days, he is the author of this book written uh, in the Old Testament times, and some call it Nehemiah's Memoirs. We know nothing about his youth or his background. When we learn of Nehemiah, God introduces him to us as an adult who is serving in the Persian royal court under King Aratakses. He is king, the king's personal cupbearer. And that's all in Nehemiah, 11, uh, in Nehemiah 1, verse 11 through 2, chapter 2, verse 1. And so the king's cupbearer was an extremely prestigious position at that time. Can you imagine being the cupbearer for the president of the United States? That person who uh, scrutinizes every morsel of food that the president eats, that the king eats, scrutinizes every drink before the king or the president drinks it. He was the cupbearer. He bore the cup. So if anyone was trying to destroy the king, uh, they would destroy Nehemiah first because he tasted everything and he drank from the cup just to make sure everything was perfect for the king. And so as we will see in these verses of Nehemiah chapter 1 verses 1 through 11, his character, Nehemiah's character, and his life are prime examples of what love, compassion, empathy, a man of God, uh, a man of faith, who understands his role in the body of Christ. He is a man after God's own heart, very similar to David. He loved God. And so we'll see his character rise up in these passages of scripture. And we want our character to, moder um, to, to mimic or um, mirror Nehemiah's character. He has examples in his character of love, compassion, and empathy. We need love and compassion and empathy right now. Wherever you're sitting right now, there's someone sitting next to you or in the same room with you that needs your love, that needs your compassion, that needs you to have some empathy right now in the name of Jesus, that you would put your flesh aside and begin to love on that person and begin to... Uh, apologizing to that person or whatever the situation may be, now is a good time for that person to see your compassion, your godly compassion, that now is the time for that person to see your character, God's character flowing out of you toward them. So Nehemiah is concerned about his homeland in this chapter. He's concerned about his ancestors, and he's concerned about the crisis that they're in, that now they've been uh, returned to their homeland from being in exile for over 75 or 79 years. And so he's concerned about them, and he comes, becomes very saddened and burdened by the news that he hears about their state, what they're going through in their mental state and their physical state and the state of the land and the state of the city, Jerusalem. So um, we want to ask the question again, why was it such an urgent need for Nehemiah to want to go to Jerusalem to be with the people and to help them restore the land. He had an urgency inside of him and I believe that urgency that was inside of him because his character mirrored God's character, God put that thirst inside of him to go and help, go and do something, go and help the people, go and bless the land. So after Nehemiah's a brother, let's start into the story now. This is the scripture. I try to give you a little backdrop every now and then. After Nehemiah's brother, Hanani, and a few of Hanani's associates uh, came to visit Nehemiah from Judah, Nehemiah inquired about the Jews in the city of Jerusalem, the, the returned exiles. He wanted to know how things were going with them, how they were doing, how is the land, how are they rebuilding. He was curious to know if they were getting along well. And we too have to be curious about our brothers and sisters. We have to be wondering and asking the question, how are they doing? How are they getting along? How are they managing? Especially when you know someone has been through a crisis. We have to have the mindset of God. And the mindset of God which was poured down into Nehemiah, Nehemiah had a concern for the Israelites just like God. 
You know some people that are scuffling. You know some people that are hurting. Yet, you do nothing about it. He wanted to know how things were going with his people. And unfortunately, when Hanani and his friends got there, the news was not good. You know the news is not good for some things around here. You know the news is not good for our nation. You know the news is not good for some of our community members. You know the, new, the news is not good for some of our own in the household that we, in which we live in. Yet, we do nothing about it. But Nehemiah is the example that we need today because Nehemiah knows that God is a way maker and that God can do anything but fail and that God will hear the prayers of his people if we are praying from a sincere place. So they informed Nehemiah that things weren't going well. The people of Jerusalem, they told him, were in dire straits. They were in great trouble and they were living in disgrace. Hear me, church. Their living conditions were appalling, was the report that Nehemiah got. They further told him that the wall of Jerusalem had been torn down and the gates to the city had been destroyed by fire. So our subject this morning is facing circumstances with prayer. And that's how Nehemiah is going to face this circumstance with prayer. Our subject this morning is facing circumstances with prayer prayer. So let's look at verse 4. In verse 4, Nehemiah breaks down in tears after hearing this report. He breaks down in tears. He sits down in his chair and he just begins to weep. He weeps for his people. He weeps because of the pain that he's feeling and the, the angst that he's feeling over the brokenness of his brothers and sisters. So he breaks down in tears, the Bible says, and when he learned of this, and he learned, and when he really broke, is when he learned that the walls of Jerusalem were still laying in ruins. Some folks' lives, the walls of their lives are laying in ruins, church, and the church is doing nothing about it. Some people's lives are broken down to almost ground zero, and we are doing nothing about it. But God is calling us through prayer to a higher standard. Anybody want to go with me to a higher standard in prayer? Walls around the city in today's society, they don't have any meaning, right? Uh, there would be no meaning for us to have walls around our city. But in Nehemiah's day, walls were everything for a city. They were a necessity. They were security. They were protection for the people behind the wall. It gave them an opportunity to have their enemies struggle if their enemies decided to attack. They had to climb the wall and get over the wall. That gave the Israelites inside the city time to fight back. They couldn't just rush in, but with the walls being down right now, the enemy could overtake them at any time if they chose to. The walls are down in people's lives. Drugs are taking over people's lives. The enemy of drugs, the enemy of alcohol, the enemy of sexism, the enemy of uh, thievery and lying and cheating and, and power and greed. Uh, the enemy is taking over because we have no protection. The church isn't praying like she should. But things are going to change. Things are going to change after we hear about what Brother Nehemiah did. The cities needed walls like we need electricity, gas, and water piped into our homes. Without it, it will be difficult to function. And the enemy of disease could come in. The enemy of sickness could come in. The church needs the walls. Build up the walls through prayer, facing our circumstances with prayer. And so the walls were symbols of power for Jerusalem. They were symbols of strength for Jerusalem. They were symbols of control and peace. Nehemiah went into mourning, the Bible says mourning, because the enemies of Jerusalem were taunting them and exercised authority over them, threatening them that if they built the wall, they would come and tear it down. If they built the wall, they would stop them in the middle of their building. Nehemiah was concerned about his people. They needed that wall for protection because otherwise they were wide open to the attack from the enemy, weapons forming against them. 
So in other words, what I'm saying is they, the enemy, denied Jerusalem the right to protect themselves in their own land, in their own city, in their own backyard. They left them open for their enemies, again, to do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and however they wanted to do it to the city and the people of Jerusalem. Yes, church, Nehemiah was deeply affected by Jerusalem's circumstances. He poured out his emotions to God. He poured out his feelings to God. He got before God and he began to express just how he felt about the news that had been delivered to him. And we too, brothers and sisters, must fall before God and mourn for our brothers and sisters and pray to God and cry out to him when we get news that our brothers and sisters are not doing too well, that they're in dire straits. That they're wide open with no protection. The Holy Spirit is our wall. And he will block the enemy and he will fight for us. Facing those circumstances with prayer. So he mourns for days and days, the Bible says. He fasted and mourned and prayed. He fasted and prayed days and days and days. He took spiritual action. You and I have got to take spiritual action over the circumstances in our life, in this world, in our nation, in our communities. We have to take spiritual authority, spiritual authority over these things that we are faced with, these circumstances that we find ourselves faced with. But Nehemiah didn't stay down. He went down on his knees. He mourned. He cried out to God. But he didn't stay down and he didn't mope over it. What did he do? Well, I want to tell you, and I'm glad you asked the question. After he grieved, the Bible says he prayed. After you've gotten devastating news, I want to ask a question. What did you do? Did you run, scream, holler, cuss? Did you want to physically fight? After you received devastating news, did you act out in your flesh? Or were you a Nehemiah? And pray. We find throughout verses 5 through 11 that Nehemiah is talking to God. Those whole, all those verses, he's talking to God. In fact, he poured out all of his emotions on God, all of his feelings. He talked all and uh, he talked it all out with God. He talked everything out with God as he searched for ways to remedy the situation. His heart was broken. He was burdened by what he heard about his people, his homeland. And he's desiring, he's feeling it. He's desiring to go back and help build the city. He's desiring, he's feeling it to go back and help build the walls around the city to protect the people. And how is he feeling this? Because he's fasting and praying for days, and God is telling him, God is talking back to him. Prayer is communication with God, communication and conversation, the name of our Bible study. We're talking to God, and God is talking back to us. God is listening to us, and we are listening to God. And God is pouring into Nehemiah what he needs to do. Go back to the city. But he's got to get to the king and get his permission, because remember, he's the king's cupbearer, and ask the king's permission to go back and help the people. So he's searching and, and he's casting all of his cares upon God because he knows God cares and he knows that God is a listening God. I don't care what it looks like, church. I don't care what it is. Whatever the circumstance is, God will fix it. God will turn it around. God will do a Nehemiah move on you if you will pray to him fast and, not, and pray without ceasing. God will move on your behalf. God is moving in this little church, Rhythm of Life Church, because we have a praying body of believers. We have faith walkers, faith talkers, faith thinkers, faith in action. And therefore, my, my wisdom and knowledge and my connection with God tells me that God is going to keep using us as long as we keep being obedient to him. Nehemiah cast 
rejoiced in his cares and he cried to God because he knew something. What did he know? Nothing that you and I don't know. He knew that they needed an almighty God, a sovereign God to intervene on their behalf. And God was going to use Nehemiah to do just that. Cast your cares upon God because he cares for his people. Circumstances cannot overtake you unless you allow them to overtake you. Sickness cannot overcome you unless you allow it to overcome you. I know someone that walks in prayer in their back and their knees every single day, but you don't hear them complaining. You don't hear them doing anything but thanking God for the ability to still keep moving. Thanking God for the ability to get up and walk anyhow for thanking God for the ability that the back is moving anyhow and God never fails he never shows he always shows up he never lets them down he's always there for him for them so let me let me reiterate church that Nehemiah did not gripe let me let me yeah let me bring this a little clear I'm saying that he didn't gripe and complain about the situation he didn't hold backdoor discussions about it. You know, when we, you and I get news, when in our humanness, we want to go chit-chat about it to everybody. We hear something on the news and we want to go chit-chat all day long, all day long, all night long, in our sleep, thinking about it, talking about it. Nehemiah didn't do this. He didn't gripe. He didn't complain. He didn't hold backdoor and backroom discussions about it. He discussed the situation with God. And he was willing not only did he discuss the situation with God, but he was willing to do something about the situation. We're willing to gossip about it, but we're not willing to take action about it. And herein how, is how we have to analyze and soul search our character. This man has spiritual character. He wasn't concerned about anything but how to help the people. He poured himself into what he, 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 he had wanted. He poured himself into what had to be done. He poured himself into asking God to open up that door so he could do it. He poured himself into listening to God so he would be clear on what God was communicating to him. The Bible says when tragedy comes to you, first things first, you pray. When circumstances are out of control, first things first, pray. And that's what Nehemiah did. When he got the news, he didn't run around griping and complaining and telling everybody they had been returned to the homeland and they were doing nothing. They were living in dire straits. He didn't go and gossip. He went straight to the Father and he began to pour his heart and that situation and that circumstance out to the Father. The one who could do, do something about it. Uh, then we're going to say church here, uh, tragedy comes, first pray. Circumstances come, pray first. Then seek ways to move beyond your grief like Nehemiah did. Seek ways. Ask God to help you get beyond your grief. Get beyond your mourn mourning. Get beyond your tears. Get beyond your lack of understanding. Ask God to help you move beyond that grief into taking definitive and specific action that helps those who need help, including yourself. If you need help, take definitive and specific action where you can help yourself. So let's look at Nehemiah's prayer. In verse 5, he acknowledges God for who he is. This is the pattern of prayer now that we're talking about, church. He acknowledges God for who he is. He emphatically tells God, I know who you are, God. I know who you are. Do you really know who God is? How much time do you spend with God on a daily basis? And then do a chart for yourself. How much time do you do spend watching television, gossiping, talking on the phone, all the things that bring you pleasure, and then all the things that you do for God on a daily basis? Balance it out. So he acknowledges God, and he emphatically tells God, I know who you are. You are the God of heaven, he says. You are the great I am. You are the great and awesome God. You are the God that can do anything but fail. You are the God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love you and with those who obey you. You are the God. 
that keeps your covenant unfailing love for your people when they live righteous and holy. Verse 6. Now get the pattern. Get the pattern. First, he acknowledges God for who he is. He tells God, I know who you are. I know you bad, God, and I know you can work a miracle. I've seen you do it before, and I know I'm going to see you do it again. And so verse 6 tells us it, it, he gets even bolder. While maintaining his reverence for God, he says, he shouts out, listen to my prayer. God, listen. Look down and see praying. See me. See me praying. See me praying day and night. I'm praying for your people, my people, Israel. God, listen to my prayer. Get God's attention. And it sounds to me when he says, listen to my prayer, I can hear him shouting that, God, listen to my prayer. He's sincere. And he wants God to, to show favor. And then, second, third, he confesses the nation of Israel's sins. You've got to have confession in your prayer. His sins and his own family's sins. He confesses the people's sins. He confesses his family's sins. He confesses his own sins. Get it clean, gurgitate it, get it up out of you. You know what you've done wrong. Get it up. God, forgive me for this. God, forgive me for that. God, I know I haven't been obedient. God, I know I haven't lived righteous. God, I know I've turned my back on you. God, I know you told me to help somebody and I refused because I thought about myself. Confess your sins to God in your prayers. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, just and will forgive us of our sins. And he will what? Purify us from all unrighteousness. That's how bad God is. He can turn your life around. He can purge you of anything that is not of him if you want to be purged. But you can't purge and then go back and pick it up. He says, if we claim we have not sinned, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And God is not a God that he would lie, nor is he a man that he would lie. And his word will have no place in our lives. So don't say I'm not a sinner. Don't say I'm not a sinner. Confess your sins. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's confession time so we can get our prayers through. So in other words, God, he, he's saying to God, we treated you bad. We treated you like dirt. We didn't obey you. We didn't follow you. We ran off like heathens and did what we wanted to do. We didn't respect anything you told us to do. We were rebels. We only ran to you when we got ourselves in trouble. How many of us run to God only when we are in trouble and then we're looking for him to bail us out? That's not God's way. For God, I'll live and for God, I'll die. I live for God 24-7. Even in my sleep, I'm living for God. In my relationships, I'm living for God. How I serve God is how I serve you. How I treat God is how I treat you. Nehemiah knew what and how to handle circumstances through prayer. And that's the idea here this morning. Know how to handle your circumstances with prayer. And believe it. Believe it. Walk in it. Walk in it as though it's already been done. It's already been answered. God, I know you're going to heal. God, I know you're going to deliver. God, I know you're going to protect. God, I know this situation and I, that I'm in is not going to last forever. So I'm going to praise you now. Some songwriter said, don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now. Shout now. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, the prison gates have been opened wide and I can walk through. I can leave my sin behind. In verse 7, 8, and 9, he reminds God of his own words. Now, we, we've talked about acknowledging God. We've talked about being bold in our prayers. We've talked about him confessing his sins to God. And now in verses 7, 8, and 9, he goes and, and, and quotes God. He reminds God of what he said. We, we have to remind God, not that he doesn't remember, because God knows all, sees all. He, he, he knows what he said. But he wants to know if we know what he said. So uh, Nehemiah reminds God of his own words. He said, God, I remember 
what you told Moses, that if you are unfaithful unto me, I will scatter you among the nations. He says, but if you return to me, God, you told Moses this, I remember it. You, if you return to me and obey my commands and live by my commands, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to a place, a place I have chosen for my home, and my name will be honored there. God is going to bring you back from wherever you've exiled yourself to, wherever you've fallen off, wherever you've turned around, whatever you're serving right now, God wants to bring you out of exile and he wants to take you to the place that he has chosen for you to dwell and his name will be honored. For biblical days, that was the temple. That was the city of Jerusalem at Jerusalem and the temple that sat in Jerusalem. That was the place that he had chose for his people. That was the place where they would worship him. Today, it's in our heart. What is in your heart, church? What causes you to act so ugly? What causes you not to care? What makes us so cold and, and uncompassionate? What causes us not to have empathy? What causes us not to pray? What causes us? Sin. Sin keeps us away from God. Because we're selfish. The flesh wants what it wants. And the spirit and the flesh war together all day. But the spirit is trying to get you to see if you satisfy yourselves and get and do what you want, then you are God. You are your God. Because God is not in our mess. Church, the place, uh, 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 as I said earlier, was the city. The city, the city. And right now I want to remind you that it's in our hearts. God dwells in our hearts. God dwells in our spirits. When we accept our salvation, we say, God, forgive us of our sins and come into my heart. Come inside of me and live inside of me. So if you pray that prayer and you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you've got to turn it around because Jesus and, and the Spirit of God is in there. It's inside of you. So lay down all your de depression. Lay down all of your jealousy and envy. Lay down your frustration. Lay down your anger. Lay down your busyness. God has a, a message and a place for you and for me. And we won't be packed out like Disneyland. There will be room for everyone. Plenty of room in our Father's house. So I hear the Lord saying, uh, you did not choose me now. Remember this, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. God is reminding Nehemiah, I chose you and I want you to go and bear fruit. I want you to go to Jerusalem and bear fruit, fruit that will last. What kind of fruit are we bearing? We fall in love with someone and we fall out of love. Not lasting fruit. And then in John 15, he, 15, 16, he goes on to say, and so whatever you ask in my name, if you bear good fruit, if you bear, bear fruit that lasts, he says, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give it to you. Again, he's not talking about just worldly things. Give me this, give me that, whatever the world has to offer, although he can and will include that if he so chooses but he wants you and me to fill ourselves up at the filling station of godly love. Fill ourselves up with God's character. Fill ourselves up with God's spirit and leadership. Fill yourself up with the things of God and all the other things will be added unto you. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom and its righteousness and all things will be added unto you. Nehemiah is seeking the things of God for a circumstance that he knows is greater than he is. And so Nehemiah cries out to God again, I'm seeking help for your people, God. I'm seeking help for my people, God. I need you to come through for me. And there they are, your servants, the people whom you so powerfully and impressively uh, redeemed. Do something, God. You redeemed these people. Do something. And do it now. And then he asked God the question, are you listening? Can you hear me? 
Are you listening? Listen to me, God. Listen to us, your people's prayers, as well as grant me favor. Now he's getting down to what he needs from God and what he needs from his boss, the king, Air Taxis. He says, grant me favor with the king that when I approach him, Father, when I approach him to ask him if I can go to Jerusalem and help restore the land and my people, that he will show me favor. Favor. We need favor. How are we going to get favor? Not on our own. And not because somebody just decided, oh, I'm going to show you favor. God needs to move on our behalf. So he approaches God. God touched the king's heart, preparing him for the question. When I ask him, can I go? Can I leave my high-paying job? Can I leave my job of covering you and taking care of you, king? Can I leave being your uh, trusted, prestigious cupbearer? Can I leave and go and take care of my people? Can I take this three-month journey? It was a three-month journey to Jerusalem from Persia. He said, can I go and take care of my people? And I hear Nehemiah whispering to himself, all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. God can do anything but fail. God, you can work this out in my favor. So now he's giving his faith testimony, Matthew 9, 6, even though that uh, he's given a faith testimony there. So he put in the king's heart is what he's asking God. Put in his heart, God, to show compassion. Compassion for me, compassion for our people. And ask him, put it in his heart as I ask him and allow him to grant me favor. His, his favor through your instruction. So as we close this morning, church, the Bible has demonstrated that Nehemiah demonstrated the elements of effective prayer. And so we want to demonstrate the elements of effective prayer this morning. Number one, at the beginning of his prayer, what did he do? I hope you're writing this down. He praised God. Number two, secondly, he was thankful to God. Number three, he repented on behalf of himself, his family, and the people of Jerusalem. Number four, he made specific requests of God. And number five, he committed himself and the people to the Lord. Nehemiah's prayer was so deep, so sincere, so heartfelt, that if we pray like he prayed, number one, we will receive clarity on any problem, any trouble or any circumstance we may face. Number two, if we pray like Nehemiah prayed, it will ensure God's power will come to help us. God's power came to help Nehemiah and help the people. Number three, because Nehemiah prayed with sincerity, integrity, and faith in God, God made it clear to Nehemiah what he wanted him to do. God will make it plain for you. He's not trying to hide it from you or keep any secrets from you. He will make it plain for you if you seek him with a whole heart. His word says you will find him. He said, go build a wall around the city. Reunite the people, Nehemiah. Restore peace, Nehemiah. Organize the governmental affairs, Nehemiah. And to ensure that God's presence can once again dwell in the hearts of people and dwell in the temple and dwell in the city. Jerusalem is God's city. So fervently and earnestly praying will cause God to move on your behalf and bring clarity just as he did for Nehemiah. Prayer is the key that unlocks the door. Prayer is so powerful. Prayer is the key that unites God and us together. Prayer cannot go untouched. You can't live your life without prayer. We need to be praying believers. We need to be Christians that don't mind bowing and bending for, the God, for God in God's presence to help situations. Pray over your circumstances and things will change. Face your trouble and your problems with prayer first. So this man was the king's cupbearer, Nehemiah. 
No food or drink of any kind got to the king without going through Nehemiah first. I wanted to say that again so you understand how important his position was and how the king may not allow him to go because the king trusted him. He had character. He was prestigious. He was honest. And he looked after his responsibilities concerning the king. So let's, uh, we the men and women of God, become like Nehemiah, concerned about people, prayerful and prepared as, as he sought the right opportunity to tell the king what he needed to go do for God's people. We too can serve God, just like Nehemiah, regardless of what we're going through, regardless of what position we hold, if we are the president of an organization, a pastor, a leader, a teacher, we can serve God regardless of the position we find ourselves in. The president of the United States can serve God. The queen can serve God, and I understand that she serves God. She believes in God. She prays to God. She seeks God. I read this. So like Nehemiah, let us use our positions, whatever they may be, from a store clerk to a waiter to the trashman, whatever position you serve, on up the chain, vice president, chairman, CEO, COO, whatever position you serve, you can intercede for God's people and you can serve God in that position. This man prayed for success and strength to cope with the massive problems awaiting him in Jerusalem. Whatever you're coping with, whatever you're dealing with, you can pray to God and he will help you deal with those massive problems. You've got to trust him, you've got to have faith, and you must pray without ceasing. You must transform into a Nehemiah, facing circumstances with prayer. The success he prayed for did not include selfish desires. It included honoring God and helping God's people. He didn't look for recognition. He didn't look for acclaim. He didn't look for people to say, oh, look at that one, look at this one. No, he wanted to serve God. He requested success for God's work to be done through all the people. My Bible says when God's purposes are at work, don't hesitate to ask for success. When God's purposes are at work, don't hesitate to ask and seek God for success. Prayer changes the whole dynamic, church. Prayer lowers our stress levels. Prayer allows us to praise and worship God. Prayer moves God to move on our behalf. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Prayer strengthens us to avoid temptation. Prayer connects us to God. Prayer opens doors that are closed to us. Prayer brings favor to your front door. Prayer pulls you and God closer together in relationship. And in Psalm 34, 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. But not only does he hear, this passage of scripture says he delivers. He delivers them out of their troubles. You want to be delivered from your troubles? It's time to cry out to God. It's time, time to pray for the release. And just as God did it for Nehemiah, He'll do it for you. When Nehemiah asked the king, could he go on this three-month journey and stay for a while to rebuild the city and help the people, the king said, yes. God will open up doors to give you a yes wherever you need it. But you've got to trust him. This is the word of God for the people of God. I hope it meant something to you. I hope it helps you move to the next level in your prayer life. Join us next Thursday at 3 o'clock California time PST for prayer, for our prayer, weekly prayer gathering. We're going to have another dynamic speaker. They're going to pour into us as God pours into them. And we're getting stronger in our prayer lives. And it's making a difference in our home lives, in our, in our environment. The only one is mad is the devil. He doesn't want us to grow in prayer because that's where our power is. That's where our strength is. That's where our hope lies. And that's where change comes about. So Thursday, meet us there for prayer. It's okay. 
You don't have to pray. You don't have to do anything but be in the midst. Like you're in the midst of God's messages and his sermons. Be in the midst of what's going on. Be in the midst of the Holy Spirit moving in action. Today is Communion Sunday. And our communication and conversation Bible study is at 11 a.m. right after this message. Pastor Errol is not playing in his leadership, I must say. He and his sister and my sister Rita are dynamic study leaders and uh, they are leading us in, in many great ways. And I want to give thanks to God for both of them. They're powerful individually and collectively, and they are blessing us and me, and God is good all the time. So zoom in from our website, or you can go to our Facebook page and uh, get the information from there. Like us, like Rhythm of Life, help us grow. Like our social media outlets and, and click like, like, the, uh, like what we're doing, like our posts, and, and help us grow. Prayer every Thursday, I share that. And don't forget to register for our third annual prayer conference on August 27th. It's coming fast. It's coming fast. And we do need you to register. You can go to our website and register. Regarding tithes and offerings, you can give on our website or you can get the address off of our website and mail in your gift. Or you can text your gift. Or you can sell your gift. If there's anyone out there who has heard God speaking to them, and you have not accepted him as your Lord and Savior, now is a good time to do that. So if you're ready, just bow your head and pray this prayer with me. God, I have heard your voice today, and I know you are real. So I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Lead me, guide me, and direct my path henceforth and evermore. Amen. If you pray that prayer, we want to welcome you into the body of Christ. Rhythm of Life is here waiting for you to get on board with us. Come on, get on board. We do everything that we would do in a brick and mortar building right here virtually. And then sometimes we gather together uh, just to fellowship with one another. You can do it. You can do it. Don't let the enemy stop you any longer. Come on. We're waiting for you. As we get ready to go to Bible study, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you bless these, your people, God. I ask that you continue to open up their eyes to the power of prayer, that you would grant them the desires of their heart, that they would want and desire to be closer to you, a closer walk with you, that they would want and desire their families to be closer to you. Forgive them, forgive me of our sins, God, against you. But today, God, we want to be Nehemiahs. We want to have a Nehemiah mindset, a Nehemiah, Nehemiah heart, a Nehemiah prayer life, God. Help us to be Nehemiahs that love you, adore you, and pray first, and pray again, and fast, and pray again. Lord, whatever trouble or circumstances anyone is in right now, I ask that you lift the burden, that you open up the door to freedom from that burden. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen. Now go have a great day on purpose because you can after you come to Bible study. Take care. Jesus loves you and we do too. Bye-bye.